Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. And I have a question for you as we start today. I want you to think about what you've seen in the past around organization charts. You know what they look like, displaying top-down roles from C-suite to employees. Well, have you ever wondered what would happen if that chart were flipped so that it was an upside-down triangle? Today, you're going to meet someone who's just done, who's done just that in his company. I'm delighted to welcome as my guest today, Nick Gallo. Nick, welcome to my show. Hey, Meredith. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're here. That's just one of the topics we're going to cover. And I want to give a shout out to Amy Bernard Bond because she's the one who introduced us. And I am so grateful because I always love meeting leaders like you who are doing great things in your company. And I have a chance to share that with my audience. Before we get started, I want to tell my audience a little bit about you. Nick is the chief servant and co-CEO of Ethico, a company that provides human resource compliance and ethics solutions that serve more than eight million employees in over a hundred countries. He has the distinction of being the only millennial CEO of a compliance company. And Nick is a certified public accountant who's worked with and analyzed hundreds of organizations over his career in advisory services, private equity, and compliance. And Nick has seen firsthand the transformative impact compliance and culture can have on generating sustainably superior results. Nick is a first generation son of an Ameri- of a Cuban refugee and member of Mensa International. He's a student of behavioral economics and organizational psychology, and he's a thought leader in the compliance and culture space. Nick has dedicated his life to serving his community, clients, and team in order to make the world a better workplace. So Nick, with that introduction, I would love for you to share how how has your journey been from all that work you've done to being the co-CEO now of Ethico? Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, A little tip is always get your mom to write your introduction for you because that makes it really sound like you're really important and uh, that you're very accomplished. So thanks to my mom for that. And also a uh, shout out to uh, Amy Bernard Vaughn. She is uh, a connector's connector. She's somebody that I just uh, love so much. And man, she put us together and it just felt like we were uh, kindred spirits right off of the uh, of the jump. So your question was what, how did I kind of become, uh, get into this role? Yes. Mm-hmm. So my brother and uh, I, we uh, we came from nothing. We're, um, we're, we're first generation Americans, as you said, and we always had a dream of running a company together after growing up in our parents' business. You know, we were always the kids, you know, going to Sam's Club, buying a bunch of, uh, you know, blow pops and selling them on the bus or starting a car washing business and things like that. We, we always just had that sort of entrepreneurial edge or that entrepreneurial itch. And uh, our parents had a business that we played an active role in from, you know, first taking out the trash and cleaning toilets to uh, later running sales teams and, you know, playing, you know, kind of a, a decent role in, uh, in the company when, when we could. And that was always a, it was, a, it was a great reference point for us as we were going through undergrad, you know, we we're learning about these abstract business concepts and we had this really tangible representation in our lives that we had an intimate familiarity with that we, you know, could use as a reference point. And instead of going to do internships, I would come back in the summers and um, in between school, you know, and uh, work in the family business. And being as that we were the first ones in our family to go to college, our parents were always extremely open to hearing 
you know, what could we do to help? That's like our family motto, see what you can do to help. And um, we, you know, we saw early on the, um, the transformative effect that you can have on not only the bottom line of a company, but on the company itself and on the experience of the employees and on, you know, the impact that that company is able to make. And that, that, that was the seed of that dream. So we spent uh, the next years after we graduated in uh, financial services, me uh, in accounting, my brother in um, investment banking in New York, uh, all in pursuit of trying to like fill our toolbox with um, tools that we could use to be you know, effective entre entrepreneurs, Lord, Lord willing, if we ever had that opportunity. We made the jump into private equity and that's where we learned you know, about how do you buy a company? How do you finance it? How do you run it you know, on a strategic level? Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that was a really interesting, uh, eye-opening uh, time for us. And when my brother was getting his MBA, we found out uh, that there was, you know, a path to running your own company, not from doing a startup like a lot of folks do, you know, kind of inventing a better mousetrap, but rather finding a profitable undermanaged business or a business that that's existing, stepping into that and, you know, making it better and growing it. So we we felt like that was really up our alley, given our backgrounds and given what our passions were. And so, we uh, we raised some money and we spent two years looking for a company to buy. And uh, through that whole uh, arduous pro process, I could probably write a whole book about the ups and downs of uh, essentially finding a neighborhood, going door to door and asking folks if they would uh, want to sell their house and selling their business to two young guys that um, you know they hadn't met before. Uh, that was a crazy ride for sure. But we luckily found this company in Charlotte, moved our families from Chicago to uh, Charlotte in 2016, and we've we've been at the helm ever since. My brother is my you know best friend. We're really com complementary to each other. We have uh, we're very different, but we're also very much alike. And it's just been a really great ride of you know trying to uh, ride this uh, ride this buck and bronco together and really kind of grow this into something special. I love that. There's so much you said that, there, Nick, that I appreciate. And I wanted to share real quick on a personal level. My daughter and her husband have two kids. And one of the things the kids always have to do, it's on their chore list. How can I help? It's one of the things they are asking throughout the day before meals and any time. So I love that you learned that yourselves. How can we help? Because it, it ties into me so beautifully with the title that you've adopted for yourself. Besides co-CEO, you are chief servant. So talk about how you came to designate yourself with that title or how it came about. Well, I always say that the best names are self-imposed. So I impose that on myself. Um, partially, um, I guess the main reason is because we want to be a company that puts our clients first. We want to be a company um, where on no, this is not about you know glorifying me or glorifying my brother. We don't want to be the pharaohs at the top of the pyramid. We want to be the root of the tree that's providing the nutrients, pulling those nutrients out of the soil and allowing uh, our tree to grow so that, you know, our clients can have a, our clients are birds. So, uh, so we can have a tree full of, uh, of birds. Um, we can't, I can't expect, and, I, and I'll say I've always, um, I've always valued like good service. You know, nothing drives me nuts more than when we go out to dinner with, you know, I go out to dinner with my wife or with, or with my family and we have bad service because I grew up in restaurants and, um, I think, a uh, you know, a good dining experience or a bad, you know, your dining experience will determine, will overshadow like the quality of the food, like almost every single time, you know? And so for us to have a company that has a good dining experience, so to speak, it means that we have to provide great service to our clients. And that means that we need to be a company full of servants. And it always seems so, uh, hypocritical or like, I don't know, uh, I, I don't know what the word is. It just seems so like, uh, insane. Like, how can I expect our company to be a bunch of servants if I myself am not a servant? So we need to model as leaders the types of behaviors we want our people to live out because I think, you know, you see this with kids and I think you see this anytime you're in a leadership position, people watch everything you do. And those actions have a much bigger impact on, uh, they have a much bigger impact than your words, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, in doing that, you know, it kind of goes along, you know, you alluded to this in your introduction of this flipping of the org chart upside down. 
And if you can, you know, if you can, if you can picture uh, what it was like us coming into this organization, you know, this this company had been a, been, a, been around for a long time, great company, great foundation, uh, great leaders, but we always believed that culture is the only sustainable competitive advantage. And for us to execute on the vision we had for whatever company we bought, a baseline sort of element of that execution was going to be, you know, imbuing a culture of, you know, people over profits in a culture uh, that, you know, a culture of psychological safety, not that's not, not, not because it's touchy feely for touchy feely sake, but rather it provides a safety for us to have candid conversations and it provides a safety for people to experiment. And ultimately it provides a safety for people to put their unique God-given gifts to work in pursuit of this organizational mission. There's just so many positive externalities that come from that thing. So as you, as you can imagine, we were stepping into a company uh, that wasn't sort of culture over everything or viewed culture as the only sustainable competitive advantage. And so we needed to make an impact. We need to build, build trust. And I think, you know, my brother and I, we both believe that, you know, symbols mean something or they can mean something when, when, when they're used right. And as you said, that old school, you know, uh, pyramid shape or that old school sort of triangle shape is something that is so um, ingrained in us. And what a way to flip that upside down, that concept by flipping that that pyramid itself upside down. It just represents so much, you know? It represents that in order to move up in our company, you move down. Uh, in order to uh, impact more people, you have to serve more people. And uh, our goal is not to get to the top of that pyramid, but rather to get toward the bottom of that pyramid so that we can support those uh, people on the top line, you know, who are really supporting our true boss, which is the client. The thing that always drove me nuts when I look at that other pyramid is that like the most important person in that equation from a business standpoint isn't even, or, or in that symbol, the most important person in that symbol isn't even represented. And that's the client. Like that's who pays the bills. That's, that's who keeps the lights on, you know? So um, flipping that upside down and uh, really us driving this servanthood thing forward, I think has at least given us a, at least conveyed a picture of what we're trying to live out every day. Mm-hmm. I want to go deeper with that because I think it's so innovative and, it, it, you know, people could sit here shaking their heads going, wait a minute, how does that really work in, in real life? So you mentioned the clients being at the very top. So let's take it layer by layer. Who's next? Who's next? And then who's at the bottom at that little, now the inverted triangle, that's the, the point at the bottom. Yeah. Um, you know, the way I look at it is like whoever's closest to the client on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's the sales development folks and that's the people answering our phones and that's the, the support folks. Those are the ones interacting with the client every single day. Uh, those people need all the support they can get uh, from those of us who control the resources or those who, who can allocate those resources so that they feel empowered to, again, not only release their, their gifts, but also to make good uh, or make do on the promises that we make in the marketplace. You know, our biggest, you know, uh, We've come into this market that we're in and uh, it's, you know, people have said that, you know, oh, we're so innovative or we're bringing this like fresh energy. But the ironic part is like we're just bringing these old school techniques or these old school principles to bear in our sort of modern transactional world. And those are things of like actually caring and actually, you know, willing to sign our name and sign our work, you know, like a painter will sign his sign his name at the at the bottom of, of the painting, that concept of signing our work and actually caring about the client and um you know, putting them them first. That's not something we we invented. That's that's the type of world that my grandparents grew up in, that my parents grew up in, and so forth. And um, so much of that has been lost in our like, you know, our faceless economy, where you know, we're you know, you have friends that you've never even sort of talked to face to face and stuff like that. Um, so those, you know, that top line are are the people that are uh, you know on the front line. And then the people below that are the uh, the managers managing those teams. And you know, as you go down you know, you're typically getting higher up in sort of the traditional sense with those executives um, lower. And I think that structure allows us to, you know, bang a consistent beat on the drum of like, we want to be the most client-centric SaaS company in the world. We want to make raving fans out of all of the people that we interact with. And so that picture then means that if the whole thing, the whole thing we're trying to maximize is the experience of the client, well, then that needs to be a consistent experience. You know, um, I use an analogy or I, you know, we use analogies about restaurants all the time, but like if you go to a great restaurant, 
from the moment you walk in, you're greeted by somebody smiling and they're pleasant, so pleasant as they take you to the table. And, you know, the, every single beat of that convert or every single beat of that meal is dialed in and there's a there's a thread through it all that is consistent right like there's a through line uh of consistency and so that then forces us to say you know how are we going to interact in every single scenario uh how can we make sure that like we're consistent from when we're reaching out to somebody who's never heard of us before to onboarding somebody to ongoing you know struggles that they have um we have to create raving fans and maximize that thing and what it also does it also creates a very easy algorithm for us at for all decisions, right? Like our values should be real things. Um, they're real things if they guide you on a path, right? Like if those are actual signposts that keep you on the path toward your goal, then you're actually using them. But what that means is like every single decision should be able to, to be bounced up against this sort of value set or this prioritization set and guide us toward the thing that is going to matter most. So by flipping it upside down, you know, kind of to bring this full circle, by flipping it upside down and focusing on servanthood and focusing on the client first, uh, it allows us to try to create an environment where we're thinking about other people first, we're uh, doing unto others as we would have them do unto us, we're trying to be the change that we we, we would see in the world in pursuit of, again, maximizing that, that employee or that client experience. Mm -hmm. I love that. So you came into an organization and I assume you still have some of the folks that were there when you first came in. Yeah. It took some time for them to get their own heads around this idea of flipping the org chart. And so I'm curious, what did you do thinking of my listeners who may want to make some changes in their own organization? What were the steps you took to get buy-in from them so that they embraced this uh, reversal in, in the structure. So I have a daughter and my daughter is four years old and she is, she loves life. She skips around. She's sweet. She's not been jaded by anything. Every she's, uh, she's loving and she, you know, she's compassionate and she's giving. And it's like, that's how we all are. What's nice about this model that we're trying to bring to bear is that it's all already in all of us. You know what I'm saying? Most people are just not comfortable bringing that kind of stuff out in a workplace because they've been told that it's not safe to do that or they've been jaded by, a, by an experience or they have workplace trauma or whatever. There's a thousand things that happen in our life that cause us to like put on this armor you know, we put on armor because we're bullied in the in the schoolyard. Well, we're not in the schoolyard anymore. And many times we carry this armor with us or we're told by somebody or we have a bad experience where we're, we're knifed in the back or we're betrayed or we're altruistic and we're, you know, uh, we're, we feel stupid for, uh, you know, for being so naive. I mean, there's a thousand stories like what I'm talking about. Um, but what the point is, is that like, we don't have to um, indoctrinate somebody into something, but rather we just have to create the circumstances for that true person that they are to feel safe enough to come out. So, you know, to your question of like, how do you do it? I think paradoxically, you just have to like do less. Paradoxically, you just have to create the circumstances of like true trust, like authentic trust. Uh, and it's, you know, people are going to feel that kind of thing out. But like, I think once you have that trust and somebody doesn't, is not living in a state of fear, which let, let's face it, many of us in uh, the business world, which is like a, such a bizarre thing. Like the business world is so bizarre to me. Um, but we spend so much time like functioning in this, like this position of fear. Well, when you're in that, that fear state, you're in your backup style, or you're kind of in that caged animal style, uh, or that's caged animal kind, kind of energy, there's no room or time for you to be your sort of authentic self. So if we can like reduce the the uh, anxiety or the cortisol or the fear in our organization and allow people to understand that like, we're all gonna mess things up. When we're running fast, you're gonna trip over yourselves. And uh, very few things are like brain surgery in life. Everything's really a lot more like baseball. Meaning you mess one thing up in brain surgery, you're in trouble. You can strike out a bunch of times in baseball and you can still make it to the uh, the the Hall of Fame. So that kind of shift in, in mentality allows for a lot more freedom, a lot more experimentation, a lot less like high pressure storm of, da of Damocles hanging over everybody's head um, and allows for a little bit more uh, trust to be built. And I think once that trust is built, you start seeing all kinds of mad magic. Um, 
I think we all just want a place that we can be ourselves in and a place that we can, you know, everybody knows that they're good at, at, at something. And sometimes we don't know if we can bring that to bear at, at work or we're scared of messing up or, or, or whatever. So I think the thing to do is to start locally and start in you on the team that you're on and how can you make those people feel more comfortable and how can you uh, check yourself before you kind of step into the organization and see like what, what, what if my own anxieties am I uh, projecting out uh, yeah. across the rest of the team and how can I start to curtail those things? Um, and I think once you start to do that, you really start to see a blossoming very quickly. You know, there's just like a bunch of, uh, you know, I mean, maybe it's because spring is coming and I'm seeing all these, all these flowers bloom, but like those flowers are not dead during the winter. They just don't have the circumstances to start bloom, blooming yet. They don't feel safe to bloom. So if we can bring them a little bit of, you know, warmth and stuff like that, there's just so much magic that ends up coming from it. And like, anyways, I'm going to stop nerding out on this. As I, as you can imagine, I could probably talk for like 45 minutes straight without taking a breath on this, but like all the positive externalities that we try to force on business can be achieved naturally if we just allow people uh, to put their, to bring their gifts to bear in pursuit of our organization's mission. That is so brilliant, Nick. It's so simple and yet it's so not done. Right. <laughs> It's amazing what just listening to you and reflecting on how simple it could be. But we all have have had, like you said, these journeys of having been hurt. So people have their armor. Some have very thick armor, right. but longer. And the other visual I had, and you and I had alluded to this um, in an earlier conversation, the idea that when a triangle, triangle is inverted, so it's on its tipping point. And so there's in some instability there. How does that translate into what you were putting into place? Is there some instability? In well, the- I think I think it's it's not it's natural to be selfish, and it's natural to think of ourselves first, right? You know, it's natural in this uh, work environment where we keep score by the bottom line and sales growth and all those kinds of things. It's natural to revert to the thing that is most common. And so the point I think is that if something is balancing on a point, it takes balance and it takes effort to maintain that thing because otherwise it's going to fall over. And I just love the picture of the fragility of it because like our culture is fragile. I think we've seen it from time and time again, you hit these different inflection points. And I mean, what is a culture? It's just a collection of individual, you know, what's a business? A business is just a collection of people that decide, we're not in a Russian gulag, they decide to come to the same place every single day. And the culture then is just the sum total of those behaviors, uh, beliefs, actions, things like that, that are within the four walls or the four metaphorical walls of an organization. So as people come in and people come out, that's going to keep fluctuating. It's like a weather pattern. It's going to keep changing. And there's a certain, and this is not, you know, we talk about culture like it's a bonfire. It's definitely not like a light switch. You don't just draw an upside down triangle and say, cool, okay, everybody do that. And then it's like done. It is an ongoing process. It's an ongoing, you know, uh, effort to keep that bonfire from dying out and put more sticks on it. And as more people gather around the bonfire, you need to put, it needs to be bigger. The combustion needs to be bigger and more people have to take part in feeding that fire or it's just going to go out. And again, the natural state of a fire is one that burns out. So you have to continue, you know, it just, that back to your point, like the fact that it's balancing on a point gives us a um it gives us a uh, a charge to make sure that that we can keep the big thing the big thing the big thing is client over every, everything the big thing is people over profits the big thing is becoming the most um you know customer centric uh software company out there and in order to do that it takes that ongoing intentionality to keep that thing prop, propped up because we're we're just going to life happens life is crazy so we're going to get distracted by things and so we have to stay focused on uh on that big thing you know well let's talk about culture for a minute because you were alluding to that multiple times yeah if if we were to ask folks in in your company what's the culture like there what would you anticipate responses would be that's an interesting question um i hope i'll say what i hope they would say um I would hope that they say that it's a, a company that is all about performance and it's a company that, you know, stands by its word and that puts its money where its mouth is. 
Uh, but it's also one that's very caring and that makes room for life and that makes room for people and that values uh, diversity of thought, of background, of whatever. Um, and that's built on merit where hard work is going to get you to where you're going to go regardless of where you came from. Um, I would also hope that they would say that uh, it's an authentic culture. Um, we do this thing on day zero. We, we, we do this thing when somebody starts and it's called day zero. And before they start filling out paperwork, we all get together in a room, me, my brother, other leaders, and we all get to kind of know each other. And it's one of the most powerful things that we've done. It definitely takes work because I end up working super, super late on those nights because it takes a long time to, to uh, carve that, you know, that, that time out. But I mean, if I could point to one thing that is like a touchstone or like a ritual with our culture that has been uh, the biggest tailwind for the impact that, 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 that we've kind of started to build, it's that thing. Because sometimes you have a bunch of, you know, you have 15 people in a room, 10 people who don't know each other, who just met each other that morning. And part of the, th one of the things we do when we first get started is everybody go goes around and tells their story of where they came from and what they've overcome and what they value and what, you know, what's their why, what actually drives them. And sometimes the whole, the whole room is weeping because you, it's just so inspiring because no one has an easy life. Everybody has, has a difficult life. And you see all these people from these different walks of life and these different sort of socioeconomic strata gathering together. And we're learning things about each other that many folk, you know, people say this all the time. I feel like I've learned more about these people I just met today than I have with the last group, group of people I spent the last two years working, working with. And it's like, how am I ever going to be able to bring my full self to work if I don't feel like anybody knows me and I don't, you know, I don't feel heard and I don't feel recognized. Now, all that to say, like, we are a, uh, a performance over everything like company. Like our goal is to be the, the most customer centric, uh, company, uh, out there. So if we're going to do that, that means we have to hold ourselves to a high standard of, of excellence, but we can hold both of those things together. You know, we can hold that, um, I don't know how I got off on this, but like my, my family was definitely high, high performance. Like we had to get A's. We were expected to, you know, be the best and we were expected to work extremely hard. And that was on the one hand, but on the other hand, I felt loved. I felt seen. I felt understood. I felt, um, uh, you know, I was believed in, I wasn't, I didn't live in fear at all, you know? So those two things, you know, I think many times in business, we think we, we can only be one or the other. And I think a lot of people are scared to like, uh, bring that, that yin out relative to like the, the traditional yang of, you know, performance, whatever. Uh, but I think when exactly, uh, but I think they're really complementary, and it, it adds a dimensionality. What did you ask though about the culture thing? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, this is all relevant because when I was asking about culture and you went to day zero, I love that because what you're really, it seems to me what you're really doing is demonstrating to them by having this day that is set aside that all of these leaders invest the time being there with these people coming on board. And this is for people at whatever level right. in the organization, right? It's just that you have this one day when you've hired X number of people that you all gather together to learn about each other. So to me, what you're doing there is you are demonstrating caring is important here. Learning about you as an individual is important here just because of how you structure that day and the investment you each make in the time to get to know those people. I think, I think you're spot on. And I think it sends a message to people that like, look, your culture is either real or it's not real. It's either some words on a wall and everyone's going to kind of do what they want, or it's a word, there are words on a wall that you're going to live by. And you're going to be constantly trying to close the gap between the reality that everybody's experiencing and this sort of perfection or this aspirational thing that you're striving toward. And, um, us all getting, getting together when somebody starts to talk about our values and to talk about our company and to talk about how your individual role fits into this, this broader story. It really is a, uh, it's a really, um, it's a really powerful thing. And it also, what, what it also does just to get into the psychology of it is like, uh, we have an opportunity to interrupt the pattern recognition that everybody has. Everybody starts a new job and they come in. And look, starting a new job is like a major life event. So if we can if we can take advantage of that major life event and we can do something different, we can at least set the stage for them to see 
that, okay, this is a different place. And I'll tell you a number of people, I, I can't even count it anymore. They sit through day zero and they participate and, you know, they're kind of nodding along and then 60, 90 days later, something like that. They come to my office and they say, you know, on day zero, you know, you said a bunch of stuff and your brother said a bunch of stuff. And I kind of didn't believe it because I've had some really bad experiences at work and I kind of heard it all before. We care about diversity and we care about blah, blah, blah. But I really see that like you guys re really meant it. And that is so like encouraging for me to like keep going with it. And again, this is not something that I did. I mean, our company is bigger than like any, either he or I could like influence something beyond this point. But we have hit that tipping point where like, this is a real thing. This fire is raging and it's not just me running into the woods uh, to like grab sticks and branches to like keep the fire going. We're getting that buy-in where it's like everyone is kind of owning it. And that's where you really start to get that uh, that positive momentum from a cultural standpoint, um, where you start getting all those positive, ex those positive externalities. I have a friend that says, you know, if you have a beautiful garden and you want that garden to grow, other things are going to grow in that garden. And it's up to you to make sure that you are making sure the right things are growing and the right things are getting the right nutrients and that you're weeding out the things that are not, that don't work there. And I think every single iteration of that, every single season, when we go through things like that is another opportunity for us to, um, you know, manifest the culture and show the culture that we're really trying to live out. Mm -hmm. So good. I love everything you're saying, Nick. I want to back up a little bit to who do you, how do you attract the right people to come on board so that you are on day zero talking to people that are most likely to be receptive, if not that day, in the coming days? How, how do you convey? Yeah, so I don't like it's a great question. I don't, you know, um, I'm going to answer this in a way, and I just don't want it to convey that like I got it all figured out because I absolutely don't. I think we've got we've gotten better at at, at attracting the right people, uh, but we definitely don't have this uh, totally figured out. So at the end of the day, I think we want to hire and bring on board people that are going to live our values, that are going to be hardworking, that are going to be tenacious. Uh, that are going to be servants and that aren't scared of accountability. You know, what I found is that a lot of people like, love the day zero part. They love the, oh my gosh, I can be myself and all that kind of stuff. You absolutely can. But also like we're doing that sort of selfishly so that we can have a team of people that we can be candid with and that we can hold each other accountable to. Like accountability is also about like performance and holding ourselves to a standard that that we all agree to. Um, so maybe I'll just kind of tell you high level what we try to do, you know, across the like onboarding or like hiring process that we've maybe you know, had a little bit of success with. So, um, you know, we try to have a consistent hiring process. We're trying to do away with like voodoo hiring techniques. Um, and, uh, cause I think we're much worse decision makers than we actually think in general, especially with people. And, you know, it's hard to really get to know somebody and really know their vibe and, you know, two hours of interaction time. So we try to do a mix of like, uh, you know, face-to-face -face and like algorithmic screening techniques, which are like essentially, you know, tests uh, or assessments. So uh, we try to write a, uh, you know, a, a job uh, description that is very forthcoming with kind of everything, you know, warts and all that's clear about sort of pay and cl clear about that we're a values forward company and stuff like that. There's enough things out there about our company where people can, you know, research uh, me and my brother and, you know, our ethos. And, you know, there's enough, there's enough content out there for people to like, if they're interviewing with us to like get kind of a sense of who we are. Uh, we'll do kind of a, an initial screen of 30 to 45 minutes, depending on role, uh, where we're focused on, you know, is this person uh, humble, hungry, and smart? There's a book by Patrick Lencioni called The Ideal Team Player, and he has this framework of humble, hungry, smart that we've re really adopted. Those actually map pretty well to our base, uh, our basic uh, values, which are uh, tenacity, um, servanthood, and accountability. So, so we're trying to assess: Is this person humble? Are they willing to roll roll up their sleeves? Are there or are there things that they're just not willing to do? Are they hungry? Like, will they run through a wall? Are they a hard worker? And are they smart? Not from a brain standpoint, but from like people. Are they good with people? Can they read a room? Do they know how to change a conversation to be tactful and to be you know empathetic and stuff like that? Uh, give them an opportunity to answer a bunch of questions. And then we typically play a little bit of a game called 21 questions where they get 21 yes or no questions to guess the famous person that uh, the interviewer is thinking of. And that's just a way to see how they think on their feet and also to see like, you know, are they intelligent enough and so forth. Once they get 
get get through that, we typically send a Wonderlic assessment. Uh, and those are, uh, we're trying to, you know, are we getting highly conscientious, thorough people? Is somebody dialed in like from a, uh, a wiring standpoint to be successful in that job? If you're not detail oriented by nature and it's a highly detail oriented job, we're just kind of setting you up for failure. Um, and so based on the results of those two things, then we'll bring somebody back for a, uh, a full kind of behavioral interview where they'll probably meet a couple of other people. And what I found with this, and sorry if this is too much detail, but I've just found we've like interviewed, I don't know, it feels like thousands of people at this point. Um, and this, this method that, that we settled on recently, uh, we've seen to get some like better gains from it because it gives us a lot of opportunity to interact with them and also gives us a lot of opportunity to um, convey to them uh, really to kind of scare them off. Uh, because like we're a fast growing company and we're not IBM and we're not GE where everything's super dialed in, right? So we're growing fast and we're figuring things out and we're trying to take market share. And that might sound good, but that's also a, a smaller ship than you might have been coming from, which means you need to get your sea legs or you're going to get seasick. And so painting that picture for folks, folks and trying to give them a picture to say like, if you're coming in expecting that we're going to have a laminated uh, instructions on the wall of this is how a, uh, a, a you know, <laughs> this is how a Big Mac is built. Uh, we don't have that. So uh, we have processes for sure, but like we're figuring a lot of things out because we're innovating and we're, we're, we're trying to sort of take over the market that uh, we're in. And so in that behavioral interview, we're really looking for patterns. Um, we ask the same six questions across every single point on their resume. What were you hired for? What are you most proud about your time at that, in that role? What was the low point? Who is your manager? Please spell it. Uh, what would they rate you on a scale of one to 10 and why? And then why did you move on? And if you ask those same questions over and over and over again, you start to see an interesting pattern and it's a lot more um, algorithmic. Uh, it's a lot more of a systematic approach to interviewing people. And it allows you um, to, I said, to, like I said, see those patterns and dig, dig, dig deeper than the ad hoc way of saying, well, tell me about your background. What'd you do in this job and so forth? Really disciplined, really walking through those things. And then, uh, of course, giving them an opportunity to ask their questions at the end. So that's how we try to attract folks. Uh, and that's how we try to increase our success rate in someone, you know, sticking around. Uh, you know, usually if somebody makes it past the first 90 days, they end up sort of staying for a long time. It is a little bit of a, of a, um, I don't know. It's a little bit of a, of a different culture. And sometimes it's, 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 uh, sometimes it sounds really good in day zero, but then like the accountability part comes forward and, you know, people's ego can't take it or, or, or whatever. So, uh, I hope that answered your, your, uh, your question. It, thinking about the ego can't take it. And I know we're close to time, but I'm just curious because you yourself are so committed to your own growth, you know, the way you have have learned and grown as a leader and a business owner, you give, you tell me you give probably even more than people want of learning and development opportunities. Right. Just highlight a few things that you've done to really make sure people know that you care about their growth and development and ability to really uh, realize their potential while they're with you. So I try to be an example of that. Selfishly, I'm going to be doing that regardless of whether I was in a one person company or a 200 person company, thousand person company, whatever. Um, I want to always be learning and I want to always be getting better. And I always want to show that I'm striving to, to get better. Um, we're so limited by like the thing that we're all most limited by is our own minds and what we believe we can do. I mean, we can do so much more than we can even imagine. And, um, so, you know, that's, that's one thing, but that's kind of sort of high level. Um, we, you know, all of our teams are doing some kind of learning on an ongoing basis, whether that's at each team reading a book, uh, or something like that. And then sort of corporately, we do a learning uh, summit every two weeks where we go through a book together and we've done a number of different books. And that's, that's been great to get people from different areas of the organization together to learn a particular, you know, to go through a particular book together. Uh, it's just it's just a great opportunity for us all to um, you know interact and like I said kind of get better and bring some skills to bear. These aren't like fiction books, of course. These are like you know uh, how to influence friends and influence people, or you know influence is your superpower, or you know uh, traction. I don't know all 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 these kinds of uh, books that 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 you know can help us build a better business and you know provide a better experience for our our uh, our clients. 
Um, and then beyond that, you know, I try to tell people, you know, everyone's annual reviews or everyone's quarterly reviews has a section about like uh, personal development goals. And, you know, I can just, you know, confidently and like proudly say no one has ever asked for anything and like the learning training certification front that I've said no to, I'm happy to pay for those things all the time. Um, I just want everyone to look back on their time at Ethico and say, wow, that was a really special company. And um, that, that company really saw me for who I was. And if it wasn't for the belief that that company had in me, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And I'm not, not to say obviously that like we're the cause for it, but if we can be, a bright spot in people's, you know, careers. Look, everybody's not going to stay here forever. You know, people move and people want to start a business or they find a better op opportunity or maybe it's not a good fit and it's not what they signed up for, whatever. But if we can, you know, treat people with dignity and create opportunities for them to like believe in themselves a little bit more or invest in them a little bit so that they can rock it forward, then I think we're going to be all right. That's great. I love that, Nick. It's such a great way to wrap up because as you know, I'm interested in talking to um, CEOs like you who are committed to creating a culture where people thrive. And I really admire all the ways you have been doing that since taking over Ethico. You and your brother deserve great uh, thanks and appreciation for creating a culture that really does help people bring their best selves to work, their real selves. Yeah. To work. So I want to acknowledge you and thank you. For well, thanks the good thanks for saying that. And thanks for ha having me on. This has been uh, a lot of fun. I feel like I talked your uh, ear off, but this was, oh, uh, I was great. It. I love this kind of stuff. I feel like this is, this is like the thing, regardless of your business and regardless of your role, you can start doing these things in your corner of the world. You can be that change you, you want to see in the world. You don't have to wait until you're a CEO or on a board or something like that. You can start today and you can start locally. That's right. I, you you didn't talk my ear off. You were great in sharing some really valuable insights and information. Good. So thank you, Nick. And I know we'll be staying in touch. I hope so. Thanks for tuning in to my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.